Welcome to this evening's event, and um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lynn Dawkins to you. I have quite some crib cards here. It's a little bit like you know, the Oscars, and there's absolutely no way I can remember all the accolades that Lynn has achieved over the years. So, if you bear with me, I won't be sort of too boring with this, but uh, I might have to look down several times. Um, so, Lynn's career began when she undertook her PhD at the University of London Goldsmiths College. And the topic area there was reward motivation in people who smoke cigarettes and people who have Parkinson's disease. <coughs> um, subsequent to that, that was 2001, I think, um, <coughs> Lynn then spent five years um, carrying out postdoctoral research connected with her PhD <coughs> topic. Um, in particular, she'd been working with smokers who had tried to quit. Um, and she was looking very much at the long-term, the short-term effects of nicotine and <coughs> how you might predict which smokers might relapse um, from their, with their abstinence. abstinence. I shouldn't have tried that word, it's not on the crypt thing. <laughs> quit. <laughs> quit. Quit. Um, in 2006, Lynn came to UEL and joined our department and she began to work with her colleagues in the recreational drug um, <coughs> research team and she continues to do so to this day. But this team then became an official research group entitled the Drugs and Addictive Behaviour Research Group, of which I think you lead, do you Lynn? Yes. Try to. Um, and to this day, it's quite some years now, 12 years probably from when you started work with people who smoked. Um, Lynn continues to research people who smoke and how we can actually help those people to quit. Um, and this of course led quite naturally to her interest in e-cigarettes. That was some four years ago, 2009. And she began to conduct research within her um, research group here. She's published a number of papers on e-cigarettes. Um, and, of course, they are in leading international journals. Lynn, I have to say, is probably the leading researcher in the area of the use of e-cigarettes and associated behaviours. And, indeed, just next week, um, she's been invited to contribute to a parliamentary roundtable on e-cigarettes. So, you're very honoured to have Lynn here today. I hope you enjoy um, the next 50 minutes or so. Um, Lynn Dawkins. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, with that introduction, I feel quite embarrassed. <laughs> Can people at the back hear me okay? Jolly good. Okay, so um, e-cigarettes, what we know so far then. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. Obviously, I'm going to talk about e-cigarettes. In fact, some of you might say I never talk about anything else. I'm going to talk about what they are, how they work. I'll have a look at the background, so where they've come from, where they're headed, a little bit on regulation. I'll then look at who uses them, how they're used, and generally why people are using them, for what purpose. I'll touch on the nicotine content and the delivery. We'll be looking at some of the evidence about whether they can help people stop smoking or not. And then one of the other burning questions is, well, are they safe to use? And then I'll finish by looking at harm reduction and some of the commonly expressed concerns surrounding the use of, of e-cigarettes. <coughs> so just to go through my um, conflict of interest to start with, I have received money for uh, research purposes from e-cigarette studies. E-cigarette companies have given me products to use for research and they've um, funded me to present my findings at research meetings. Now they don't tell me what I can and I can't research and they don't tell me where I can publish or what I can publish so um, I, I um, can, can control that. And I um, just want to say thank you to Totally Wicked who sponsored this event tonight and again they have had no um, a say in what I'm going to present to you and they haven't seen the slides so they don't know what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so I'm going to start by looking at e-cigarettes. What are they? Okay, so e-cigarettes are basically battery-operated devices. 
they deliver nicotine not through burning tobacco, but via a, a vapor that is inhaled. So there's no smoke, although the vapor that is exhaled does resemble smoke, which is why often smokers refer to, or vapors refer to the activity as, as vaping, because it kind of resembles the, the smoking behavior. Now, all e-cigarettes have three basic components. So a battery here, uh, this is also the battery, an atomizer, and a cartridge. And the cartridge contains um, a, a nicotine-containing solution. So um, the battery powers the atomizer to heat up the nicotine-containing fluid to create a vapor that the user can then inhale. With these types of e-cigarettes that you can see on this slide, um, nowadays, the old ones used to look like this. The cartridge slipped on top of the atomizer, which screwed into the battery. But now these two pieces are generally combined on these types of devices and are referred to as cartomizers. So more commonly referred to as cartridges. So these bits, these bits here are the cartridges that screw onto the battery. So you've got a basic two-piece kind of simple type um, design. Some of them also have LED lights on the end that light up when the when a user inhales on the device. So this can further resemble the act of smoking. But usually it's a blue or a green light in order to distinguish it from um, cigarette smoking. Uh, okay, so as you can see, all the, all the um, devices on, on this screen resemble cigarettes in some way. Um, in terms of size, shape, and sometimes color as well. But not all e-cigarettes look like this. So I've referred to these ones on this slide as so-called second generation e-cigarettes. They contain the three basic components, the battery, the atomizer, and the cartridge, but they look quite different to the cigarette-like ones that I showed you in the first slide. So they look like pens or screwdrivers, they're much more colorful. Um, they have larger batteries here, here, and um, this way they hold their charge for longer. So this is useful for the user, so the user doesn't have to um, put the battery on charge throughout, throughout the day. These will la last much longer. Some of the atomizers in these types of devices also can be set to variable voltages, which users state can affect the nature of the um, vaping experience. Whereas the e-cigarettes in the previous slide also with the nicotine containing fluid was contained within the cartridge so the user didn't come into contact with it, with these type of devices you have a so-called tank filled cartridge. So here, here, and the user can fill these cartridges up uh, with the fluid um, themselves. So in these cases, the user does come into contact with the fluid and fills up the cartridges him or, him or herself. Now, I think my colleagues are starting to pass some of these e-cigarettes around. So for those of you that haven't seen them before, you can see kind of what some of them look like and have a little play around with them. I forgot to say on the previous slide, you, you can also get disposable e-cigarettes as well. So these just come in one piece. They look like a cigarette and you can take two or three hundred puffs and, and then throw it away. I see there's some other things as well as e-cigarettes being passed around. Um, okay, so um, the liquid then. So e-cigarette liquid contains three basic um, components, propylene glycol and or vegetable glycerin. This accounts for 95% of the fluid. We then have nicotine and um, flavorings. So the propylene glycol is really the vehicle, the mechanism by which nicotine and the flavorings are delivered. And you need it to generate the vapor. Uh, of course, um, most e-cigarettes contain nicotine, usually um, within the region of six to 30 micrograms per milliliter. And it's usually expressed in terms of weight per volume, so micrograms per milliliter. Some manufacturers do produce 
e-cigarette liquid that contains no nicotine at all. So the user can have the vaping experience without the nicotine content. And fluids go up to, I think, about 36 um, micro micrograms per milliliter. I think that's about right. Also, um, flavourings. So, flavourings are quite important because it, the taste is quite boring without them. Most commonly, um, flavourings are tobacco, mint or fruit, but there's loads and loads of different flavours available. Uh, chocolate, vanilla, bubblegum, pina colada, aniseed, Red Bull, you know, all kinds of different um, flavours are, are available. So that's what they are, and you've got some to have a look at as well as they're coming round. I'm going to turn next to look at um, background. So e-cigarettes were made in China and were first introduced into the Chinese domestic market in 2004, and then came over to Europe late 2006, um, 2007. And it's a rapidly growing market. So sales of e-cigarettes have either doubled, doubled or trebled every year since their introduction into Europe. So, for example, um, e-cigarette use in smokers in this country has increased sixfold from 2% in 2010 to 12% in um, 2012. And um, a report by Action on Smoking and Health, the charity ASH, estimated that there's currently 1.3 million e-cigarette users in the UK. Now, they're mainly produced in China, although the, they are now starting to be produced, both the devices and the fluid, in the UK and in the US, but still mostly in China and then widely distributed. It's a highly fragmented market with hundreds of different brands, mostly um, distributed over the internet. So there are quite a lot of um, uh, differences in terms of, of quality there. Interestingly, recently, tobacco companies are now starting to buy into the e-cigarette market. So the big tobacco giants are either buying out e-cigarette companies or making their own um, e-cigarette type devices. So indicating that they think that perhaps e-cigarettes are going to be quite important. Now the current situation uh, with regards to regulation in this country and in the um, EU E-cigarettes at the moment are a, a general consumer product, so they come under general product safety um, directive. So this is enforced by the Home Office, the National Measurement Office, um, and there's other licensing that also applies to the various components, to the liquid, to the electrical components, chemical safety legislation, electrical legislation, and packaging legislation as well. Um, this means at the moment they are readily available, as I said, mostly over the internet, and they're able to compete with tobacco cigarettes. The status quo is unlikely to remain. The EU and the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, the MHRA, have both recently announced their plans to regulate e-cigarettes as medicines. Members of the uh, European Parliament are currently debating on this. They make a decision next week about how to regulate these. So it'll be interesting to see, I think the 11th of July, they, they will make their decision about this. Interestingly, in the USA, they're taking a slightly different approach. So after a failed attempt to regulate e-cigarettes as medicines in America, the FDA have announced their plans to regulate e-cigarettes as a tobacco product. Now, the thing with e-cigarettes is they're, they're not clearly one or the other. So they're not a tobacco delivery, they don't, they don't contain tobacco, so they're not like cigarettes. And on the other hand, they're not really a medicine either, so they're not designed to treat a, a disease. And many, but perhaps not all, e-cigarette companies are, are not making um, health-related claims. So they fit somewhere in the middle here, so it's really hard to know kind of, well, where exactly do they fit, how exactly should we regulate those. So it looks like we're moving towards 
medicines regulation, and there are some strong feelings um, either side about whether this is a good idea or not. On the positive side, regulating as a medicine may provide safeguards in terms of efficacy, quality, and safety as well. But those on the other side of the debate say, well, you know, hold on a minute. The added issues, the burdens on compliance, the restricted availability might make it more difficult, might make e-cigarettes a less attractive product to the user. So arguably nobody wants a, a safe but dull product. There's the argument that it might make them harder to get hold of than cigarettes, than cigarettes which could then feed into the, the big tobacco giants weakening their competition. And there's also the argument that this could encourage illegal devices. Now, I'm not going to um, dwell on this, but if we want, we could have a, a bit more of a discussion about this at the end, see what people think about this. So next, I'm going to move on to um, who uses them, how are they used, and why do people use them? So these findings that I'm going to present to you now mainly come from two fairly large-scale surveys, one conducted by us here at UEL and another survey by Etta and Bullen conducted the two years before. So here we're looking at a quite a large sample of, of current e-cigarette users, about 5,000 e-cigarette users, and um, these two studies asked people why they use them, for what purpose, how they use them, and so on. So the results of these two surveys indicate that, well, most of the respondents, interestingly, were male, between 65 to 70% were male. Age was generally between about 30 and 50, with the average age being in the early 40s. Most were white, and over half were educated to degree level or above. And we seemed to be surveying mostly um, ex-smokers, and only a, less than half a percent of people taking part in these surveys, regular e-cigarette users, um, said that they were never smokers. So moving on to how people are using them, we asked people about you know, how long they'd use them, um, what types of products they use, what flavours, what strengths and so on. And the first thing to note is that um, users were using e-cigarettes for a pretty long duration of time, so the average was 10 months, suggesting perhaps that people are using e-cigarettes as a, a replacement for cigarette smoking rather than as a means of quitting nicotine completely. And in relation to product type, although most people think of um, e-cigarettes as um, devices that resemble cigarettes and resemble cigarette smoking. This is not what we found in our survey. So we found that uh, most people, 72% of people, were using what I've referred to as the second generation type e-cigarettes. So these ones where you have the fluid filled tanks that the user um, fills themselves. Only 18% said they used the cigarette-like devices. And interestingly, in our sample, we saw 9% of people saying that they kind of built their own. So they bought the various different components and mixed and matched and put it together. In terms of the strengths used, the 18 milligram per, per milliliter strength nicotine uh, containing fluid was the most popular, with just about half the sample using that, followed by the eight, followed by the 11. A lot of people said they combined their strengths, so they bought the fluid and mixed their own, or they used different strengths at different um, times of the day. And only 1% of the samples said that they used the zero, um, no nicotine, e-cigarette liquid, indicating that for the regular e-cigarette user, the nicotine content is, is quite important. Preferred flavour, well, most people um, state that they prefer the tobacco flavour, followed by the various fruit flavours, and, and mint and menthol also were quite popular. So we've looked at who, who uses them, how they use them, and so next on to why people are using them. So from the two surveys, these are some of the most commonly cited reasons for using e-cigarettes. So people reported using them as a complete alternative to cigarette smoking or to quit smoking or avoid relapse. 
People said that they used them as a way of dealing with their cravings for cigarettes when they, when they hadn't smoked for a while or to avoid withdrawal symptoms associated with not smoking. It was generally perceived by people in this sample that they were less toxic than um, cigarettes and that was a reason for use and also that they were cheaper than smoking. Um, another response was that people used them to get around smoking restrictions, but this was a much less commonly cited response than the ones that I've listed here. Now, just echoing the findings from that survey that people are using e-cigarettes in a quit attempt, these data are taken from a national um, household survey of smokers and recent ex-smokers from the smoking toolkit study. So you can see basically these are the, the percentage of people who are trying to quit smoking who are using e-cigarettes to help them. So you can see since July, that doesn't say it, that should say 2009 there. Um, since July 2009 we're seeing a steady increase in the number of people using e-cigarettes to help them stop smoking with this massive spike in the last year or so. So April this year, about 25% of people said that they were using e-cigarettes to help them to stop smoking. <clears throat> so um, if e-cigarettes are going to be helpful to, um, to help people to stop smoking, then they need to be able to um, help to reduce the craving that smokers experience and the withdrawal symptoms. So we all know when smokers haven't had a cigarette for a couple of hours, they begin to feel a bit anxious and a bit irritable, and they also start to experience a strong urge to smoke, um, known as cravings. So a couple of laboratory studies have, have looked at whether e-cigarettes can help with this. So smokers typically are asked not to smoke for 10 to 12 hours, come into the lab, puff on an e-cigarette, and then they rate their craving before and after. And um, a couple of studies, one in the US and one in New Zealand, have shown that using the e-cigarette was effective at helping to reduce craving for a cigarette. It wasn't as effective as having a cigarette itself, though. In our study, um, with 86 um, regular smokers who hadn't smoked for several hours, we gave half of them a, a no nicotine e-cigarette and the other half a nicotine e-cigarette. And after five minutes of use, we found actually craving did, uh, was um, improved in both groups. So even just after five minutes, the non-nicotine e-cigarette was helpful. 20 minutes later, however, those in the, who had had the nicotine e-cigarette showed an even further reduction in their craving. So overall, these studies on cravings suggest that yes, it, is, it can help to alleviate tobacco cravings. Also, uh, perhaps not to the same extent as, as smoking a cigarette itself, but interestingly, perhaps the actual just act of smoking, that the nicotine content isn't so important in the early stages. Okay, so I'm going to move on to what I think is um, quite an interesting bit now, but it does get a bit graph heavy. So for, for those of you that don't like to do graphs, you can just count how many times I say nanogram. So we've seen that from, from the survey data that people do seem to be reporting that they're using e-cigarettes to stop smoking. But there's some um, mixed findings about whether they can actually deliver nicotine. So these are two early studies, well, 2010, that's early for e-cigarette research, that looked at smokers who had never used an e-cigarette before, and they took blood samples to see how much nicotine is actually getting into the blood. And both of these found that really it wasn't. Um, so study one, for example, looked at the um, Royan e-cigarette, the 16 milligram, compared it to the zero milligram, as well as the Nicorette inhalator and to regular tobacco smoking. And they found that from using the nicotine-containing e-cigarette, maximum blood levels of 1.3 nanograms per milliliter were produced, and that took about 20 minutes. Findings from the nicotine inhalator were kind of roughly similar to that. But from tobacco smoking, the level was 10 times higher, so about 13 nanograms per milliliter, and it didn't take as long. 
And in a second study, um, the authors of this study compared two different brands of the 16 milligram um, e-cigarette. And again, they compared it to tobacco smoking and showed that whilst tobacco smoking significantly raised blood nicotine levels, neither of the two e-cigarette um, e-cigarettes were able to in these kind of naive e-cigarette users. So they, they'd never used one before. Now, it has been suggested that the reason we haven't seen increases in blood nicotine delivery in these two studies are because the study used people that had never used an e-cigarette before. And more recent research suggests that um, using an e-cigarette is very different to smoking a tobacco cigarette. Um, you have to draw on it for much longer in particular. So this next study then thought, well, let's have a look at people who are already experienced in using an e-cigarette. So eight experienced vapors who all used their own device that they were usually using, and they used their own e-cigarette liquid as well. And they found, a, a, it was a completely different story here. So we can see that um, very low levels when they hadn't smoked at baseline. And then after just 10 puffs, this is now increasing to 10 uh, nanograms, or about, even more, about 12 nanograms per milliliter. And they then continued to use it for the next hour. And again, we're seeing a steady increase over the next hour. So achieving about, I can't see from this angle, about 13 nanograms per milliliter. So that is in quite contrast to the studies I presented on the previous slide. So we're now seeing levels um, 10 times higher. Now that study, so don't look at this yet, that study used people who were using their own devices and they were experienced users. They were mostly using second generation type e-cigarettes in that study. So we don't know whether it was the actual experience or the device that they were using that led to the better nicotine delivery. So I'll just take you through this slide. Um, in this study, we used a standard two-piece cartomizer, simple stick-like um, device. And everybody had the same device and everybody had the same 18 um, milligram per milliliter nicotine cartridge. And we found, if you just look at the blue for now, this is the average. So we can see an increase um, from baseline to after 10 puffs and another steady increase throughout the next hour when people just used the e-cigarette as much as they wanted to. So, so, so we can see again, we're, we're kind of seeing what was seen in the previous study. But what's quite interesting about this study is if you look at some of the individual participants. So this person at the bottom in brown, person one, is showing really very, very low levels of, of nicotine, um, less than five nanograms per milliliter. Whereas this person, person two in green, is getting really high, like almost up to a peak of 25 nanograms per milliliter. And this is the types of level we're seeing from cigarette smoking. So I think these findings are really interesting because they all use the same device and yet we're seeing quite marked differences in the amount of nicotine actually getting through, suggesting, but there may be other reasons, but suggesting that the way people are using the device, the, the way people are puffing or, or vaping might be particularly important. <clears throat> So to summarize what I've said so far, I've, I've told you what e-cigarettes are, nicotine delivery devices um, that are, you, that are you delivering nicotine via a vapor rather than via burning tobacco. They're used by smokers who say that they want to quit or want to replace their tobacco smoking. And we've seen with increasing popularity. So the number of people using e-cigarettes in a quit attempt is increasing dramatically. We've seen that they're moderately effective at alleviating um, tobacco craving. And in the more recent slides, we've seen that they seem to be effective in delivering nicotine, particularly in those who have got used to using them. So, OK, why do we need another nicotine-containing product? We've already got um, NRT patches, gum, and so on. So why, why is it important? So how did e-cigarettes um, come about? Why do we need them? Well, I want to take you back now to reminding you about the dangers of cigarette smoking. So in this country, smoking kills an estimated 81,700 people every year. That's 223 people per week. And 
by the end of this lecture, nine people will have died as a direct consequence of tobacco smoking. The average smoker loses 10 years of their life compared to non-smokers. And if smoking doesn't kill you, it has multiple other ways of making your life a misery, increasing the risk of stroke, angina, increases blood pressure, you know, the list, the list goes on. You don't need me to list them all. Now, most smokers, if not all smokers, are very well aware of these um, awful health consequences of smoking, yet 21% of the population continue to smoke. So there's something just so compelling about smoking that you know, I'm just really desperately trying to, to understand. T tobacco smoke itself contains more than 5,000 known chemicals, and 40 of these are known to cause cancer. Now, it's, the, it's these chemicals collectively referred to as tar, as well as the burning of tobacco that causes carbon monoxide that's associated with these adverse health effects. Nicotine, by comparison, uh, is relatively safe. And with this recognition that nicotine itself is fairly safe, it's not the dangerous part about cigarette smoking, although it is the, the bit that keeps people addicted, this led to the development of nicotine replacement therapy, NRT, in the form of patch, gum, lozenge, and so on. So in 2009, the Office for National Statistics conducted um, a survey, looked at smokers and their intentions and attitudes, and they reported that 67% of smokers said that they want to stop Actually, that means there's another 33% that, that don't even want to stop, so I'll come back to that later. 75% attempt to stop, so there's some people attempting to stop that don't want to stop, interestingly. Um, only 8% are actually successful at two years. And in this survey, people who had tried to stop smoking and then who started again were asked to give reasons for a recent relapse. Stress, as you might expect, was the most commonly reported reason, accounting for about 40%. But then a lot of people said they started again because they like smoking or because they miss the habit of smoking. When we just look at unaided quit attempts, so people trying to go cold turkey, as it were, 95 to 97% of these end in failure. So you would think that if you give people um, nicotine, you replace the addictive part of, of smoking and give people nicotine in the form of NRT, this might help them. And, in, and indeed it does. Over 100 placebo-controlled trials have shown that if you use NRT, it does double your chances of being successful at quitting smoking. The problem is that the rate of of being the success rate is so low to start with that even with this doubling, this only leads to approximately six to ten percent of people quitting successfully in the longer term. So even with NRT, more than ninety percent of quit attempts unfortunately um, fail. So why do so many quit attempts end in fail? And I've just kind of thrown a few questions there. I thought we could, we could just speculate on this. Um, one possible uh, reason is that there's still, amongst many people, a reluctance to use nicotine. People still don't seem to understand that whilst the nicotine is addictive, it's not the harmful part of smoking. As I've said, it's the burning of tobacco, it's the carbon monoxide and tar that's associated with all those awful health risks. So there is a resistance, actually, amongst some people to even use nicotine because they're worried that, um, that, that the nicotine is kind of bad, bad for me. It could be that nicotine replacement therapy is just um, not delivering nicotine effectively. Well, there's been lots of studies that have looked at this, and it does deliver nicotine. It doesn't deliver the massive spike and the very high levels that you get from tobacco smoking, though. We know that smokers, and we've talked about this a little bit already, that smokers have fingertip control over the amount of nicotine that they can get from a cigarette. And it's thought by some that this control might be really, really important for people. That's what they like about smoking. And we've seen perhaps that e-cigarettes can do this too, although you know, we need more research there. NRT probably can't do this to the same extent. Certainly a patch, you slap it on, you don't have so much control about how much nicotine you're getting. 
other reasons? Well, it could be we've seen that people have said that they enjoy the habit of smoking, they like the activity of smoking, so it could be um, perhaps arguably the Nicorette inhalator does this, but many other forms of NRT don't replace the habitual aspects of smoking, the feeling of the smoke in the mouth, the hand-mouth activity and so on. Um, so it looks like um, e-cigarettes might have a place here. They can deliver, deliver nicotine and they can address the other hand-mouth um, activities of smoking. What's clear from the last few slides and what I've said is that there's plenty of room for further development of innovative pro products that can contribute to helping smokers to really stop over the long term. Okay, so I've said that um, smokers tend to be using e-cigarettes to help them stop. So let's turn next to have a look at the evidence um, about whether this is indeed the case. So back to the two surveys that I mentioned earlier. So this is just asking people, um, did it help you to stop smoking? Uh, in the first study, 74% of regular e-cigarette users said that they hadn't smoked at all for at least a few weeks since they started using the e-cigarette. And a further 14% reported that since they started using the e-cigarette, the number of cigarettes they smoked had reduced quite dramatically. And in the other study, 92% said that the e-cigarette had helped to reduce their smoking. And of the ex-smokers in this survey, 96% said it had helped them to stop smoking. So we're seeing kind of, these are fairly impressive results um, when you, you first look at these, but just a note of caution about this. We're sampling regular e-cigarette users here um, using an online survey. So we're not sampling people that might have used the e-cigarette uh, and not been successful. And so we're really just capturing a, uh, a distinct group of people here. We're not representing everyone. So we do need to look at other ways of, of gathering data. So in this study, this was um, 200 and something people um, who had purchased an e-cigarette. And um, this group of researchers followed people up six months after they'd bought an e-cigarette and asked them about whether they'd managed to stop smoking. And 31% of people said, yes, they had managed to stop smoking six months later. Um, those people that were using the e-cigarette more intensively, so they were using it more than 20 times a day, had an even higher quit rate. So 70% of people who, were, who reported using it more than 20 times a day had, uh, had stopped. In this next study, 40 smokers were given an e-cigarette and again followed up six months later. And in this study, 55% of them had either stopped smoking completely or had cut the number of cigarettes they smoked by half. And this was in a group of smokers who said they weren't willing to quit. So again, we're seeing fairly impressive uh, results from these studies. What we really want to do, however, is to conduct what we refer to as randomized controlled trials, so the gold standard approach in stop smoking research. So we get participants, smokers, and we allocate them at random to various different conditions. We follow them up and then look to compare the number of people that have successfully stopped smoking. Um, the problem with these types of trials, although they're the, they're the gold standard, they're expensive, you need large sample sizes, and there's a question really over who should fund such studies. However, there have been a couple. So um, firstly, this study um, in Italy, of 300 smokers, again, these were smokers that weren't interested in quitting. They were allocated to either a 7.2 milligram nicotine e-cigarette, a 4.8 milligram nicotine e-cigarette, or an e-cigarette that didn't contain any nicotine. And we do have some results available from this study. So after one year, 13% of those in the 7.2 nicotine condition had stopped smoking completely, 9% in the 4.8 condition, and 4% in those that hadn't received, uh, um, the, who had received an e-cigarette with no nicotine. So this was at one year, and then a second, much larger scale survey is, uh, sorry, randomised controlled trial, is being conducted in New Zealand. It's been going on for a few years now, and this is a group of 657 smokers. I think that's about the right figure. 
um, who were using randomly allocated to either a 16 milligram nicotine e-cigarette or a no nicotine e-cigarette and or to a nicotine patch condition. And these smokers are all followed up to six months and I think we're expecting results from this survey in the autumn. The next frequently asked question about e-cigarettes um, is, well, are they safe? Are they safe to use? Um, well, safety is obviously not an absolute term. And um, when we're talking about safety, we have to be very, very careful, I think, here. Um, because, of course, e-cigarettes are not absolutely safe. There's bound to be some risks associated with engaging in this activity. But what can we say is safe? I mean, lots of other commercially available products bleach, razor blades, we can't say that they're safe. Even uh, medicines, paracetamol, and smoking cessation, quit smoking medicines as well. Uh, Champix, for example, are not without their risks. So when we're talking about whether e-cigarettes are safe, I think we need to bear in mind um, what question we're asking. I think we, we need to ask, are they safe compared to cigarette smoking? That's the relevant comparison to make because people are using these generally as an alternative to cigarette smoking. So when we're looking at um, safety aspects then, let's just remind ourselves about the contents of the fluid. So I said earlier, we're looking at nicotine, various flavors, and propylene glycol and or uh, vegetable glycerin. So in relation to nicotine, the lethal dose for an adult somewhere from 30 uh, micrograms, a um, bit lower for children and a bit higher if you're a smoker. So um, it's unlikely that a vapor who's using an e-cigarette is likely to overdose or, or experience nicotine poisoning because um, they're controlling how much they're getting. And we've talked about regulation, self-regulation and titration, and you can get as little or as much as you want from it, really. Um, and even if you didn't, if you start to take too much, you start to feel a bit sick and you get a headache and it stops you using it. So unlikely that a smoker or, or a vapor would accidentally take too much nicotine. However, I think the nicotine-containing fluids are um, a different story. So, for example, if we have a 20 milliliter bottle of um, fluid that contains 18 milligrams per milliliter of nicotine, then you can work that out. It would contain 360 milligrams of nicotine in, in that bottle. Now, you can see this is above the lethal dose. So if you drank that, it, it would kill you. Um, while I was researching for this lecture, I did start looking into, well, has anybody died from accidentally or, or indeed on purpose um, swallowing bottles of nicotine containing fluid? And I found nothing until May this year. And then I did find a report of a two year old girl in Israel who had somehow managed to um, drink some nicotine containing solution and, and did in fact die from this. So I think we have to be careful about the e-liquid itself. And there's, because there's so many different brands, there's quite considerable variation in the standards of the bottles of nicotine containing fluid. In regard to flavors, um, we've seen that um, e-cigarette liquid also contains a number of different flavors. Um, these are mostly food additives that are generally regarded as safe um, to swallow. But um, we don't know really what the effects are of inhaling these substances. So they weren't designed for inhalation, so even though they're, they're, they're safe for swallowing. And we haven't looked at this yet. So research needs to be done to see if there are any long-term effects of inhaling um, flavors over a longer period of time. And then we have a propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin. More commonly, we see propylene glycol in um, e-cigarettes. And I said earlier, that this accounts for the majority of the uh, liquid, about 95%. It's generally found as an additive in foods. It's found in medicines, cosmetics. It's also found in artificial fog that's used in theatres and clubs and so on. And again, it's generally regarded as safe for oral consumption. 
Um, as, as was the case with the flavorings, we don't know yet what the longer term effects are of inhaling propylene glycol. And we've seen from the earliest work that I presented you that people are using e-cigarettes for quite a long period of time, an average of 10 months in, in one of the studies. So it is important to look at whether there are any longer term effects on health of, of vaping, um, of continually, continually inhaling this. It is a humectant, so it does absorb moisture that it comes into contact with, so it has an effect. It might dry the mouth and throat, and some people report these. Uh, vegetable glycerin is also used in e-cigarette vapour. It um, creates more of a noticeable vapour, and some people think this is important, so the, the various levels differ between different types of e-liquid. Um, the, one of the issues with this, again, it's used as, in food additives. It's generally regarded as safe um, for ingestion. But there have been cases in medicines where uh, contamination with a toxin, diethylene glycol, has been um, detected and has led to some fatal cases. In relation to, so that's meant that the FDA have recommended that manufacturers test all their batches of products that contain glycerin just to check for the presence of this um, toxic. It was found in one out of 18 samples that were tested by the FDA, and this is commonly cited um, in many reports since. Um, I don't believe it's been found in any samples since, and the levels found were um, not toxic levels. But it's probably good practice for manufacturers using glycerin to check for the presence of diethylene glycol. Okay, so I've talked about what's in the e-liquid itself. So next we're going to move on to uh, what's in the vapour. And this study looked at a number of different toxic compounds, including nitrosamines, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, and toluene. So you can see I can pronounce them. And they looked at 12 different brands of e-cigarettes and looked at the content of the vapour and compared this with what's found in tobacco smoke. So this is the average from the 12 um, different brands of e-cigarettes. And um, you can see these are the, the levels found in cigarette smoke. And in the final column, we've got the ratio. So how much more you find in cigarette smoke compared to e-cigarette vapor. And you can clearly see from this that we're seeing much higher levels in tobacco smoke compared to e-cigarette vapour, somewhere between 9 and 440 times higher levels in tobacco smoke compared to e-cigarette vapour. Okay, this next study shows um, effects of vapour on indoor air quality. So it's looking at particulate matter, 2.5. Particulate matter are basically um, tiny little particles suspended in the air. The 2.5 just means they're really, really little. And they're not very good for you. So you don't really want high levels of particulate matter um, in the air. And it's measured in micrograms per cubic metres. So we can see here, um, this is after one and a half minutes of e-cigarette use, we can see a level of three. Compare this with tobacco cigarette, we've got a level of 281. After three minutes of use, it goes up a bit. So in e-cigarette vapor now, there's a level of 43 micrograms per cubic meter. But again, a whopping great um, 901 after three minutes of, of smoking a tobacco cigarette. So to try and put this into context, the World Health Organization have issued guidelines on what is a safe level of, of particulate matter in indoor air, and they suggest that a level of about 40 shouldn't be exceeded in any 24-hour period. So you can see the level after three minutes of, of e-cigarette use is kind of at that borderline uh, acceptable level. But by comparison, we've got these huge, obviously it's not acceptable, these are not acceptable levels from tobacco smoking. So the main message here really, and from the previous slide, is e-cigarette vapour does reduce air quality, but to a far less greater extent than tobacco smoke. 
Okay, so what about switching from cigarettes to e-cigarettes? So I've already gone through, um, most people are using e-cigarettes to quit smoking and the evidence indicates that they are quite a fairly effective for helping to stop smoking. They are delivering nicotine from the evidence that we have so far. And we've also seen when we compare them to regular smoking, they're much, much safer. So, the best approach really would be for every single smoker to stop smoking and to stop using nicotine completely. In an ideal world, that is what we would want to see happening. But we've also seen from some of the earlier stuff that I presented that not everybody even wants to even try and stop smoking. And of those that do attempt to stop, even use, with using NRT, 90% fail. So we've also seen that people cite missing the habit of smoking, missing the activity of smoking, and liking the smoking habit as um, one of the reasons why they relapse again. So what do we do with this percentage of smokers that are simply unwilling or unable to quit smoking? Well, you know, perhaps we could substitute the deadly habit of smoking with a, more, with a, with a safer, lower risk alternative. Um, so that's what we mean by harm reduction. And it's not new to e-cigarettes, we've seen it applied elsewhere. So the general idea is that you replace a habit or an activity that's very, very dangerous with something that's not absolutely safe, but is much, much better for you. Now we've already seen that there is a huge increase in numbers of smokers using e-cigarettes to quit smoking. And um, we're also seeing sales of tobacco cigarettes decreasing for the first time in years. So if huge numbers of people are successfully switching over to e-cigarettes, this has the potential to really dramatically reduce um, death and disease associated with smoking. <clears throat> so I'm going to finish off by looking at some of the commonly expressed concerns, and um, some of these have already been raised. So this is the first issue. Um, it's argued that e-cigarettes appeal to young people and may then be a gateway into tobacco smoking. Um, we really don't have any evidence yet on, on whether this is the case or not. <clears throat> so there was a study of, of um, young people in Poland uh, who were asked about whether they'd tried an e-cigarette and a fifth of, of Polish, Polish youth said that they had tried an e-cigarette but most of these were people who had also previously tried a cigarette. Of those who had never smoked cigarettes, 3.2% reported that they had tried the e-cigarette. Now what we'd really want to do with that sample then to see if, it, they, if they then go on to smoking is to look at how many of those who tried it then went on to use it regularly and then went on to use uh, tobacco cigarettes. Obviously we don't have that information at the moment. So it is possible, yes, it's possible that e-cigarettes are appealing to young people and may be a gateway into smoking, but it's also possible that the opposite is the case, that they're leading people away from smoking, and we simply don't have the evidence um, about that yet. We'd need to look into that. Now, the next question relates, relates to this, I think, really. So there is an argument that e-cigarettes kind of normalise or glamorise cigarette smoking. And this goes against all the efforts over the last few years to try and make e-cigarettes less acceptable and less normal. <clears throat> um, also the fact that celebrities are using e-cigarettes might, might glamorise them and draw more people into using them. So if people are seen using them, there's an argument that people might think they're more acceptable, people might think cigarette smoking is more acceptable, and that then might increase the number of people that are smoking. Now again, we just don't know if this is the case. And we might, if it is the case, we might also want to balance that against the harm reduction associated with the number of people at the other end who are switching from smoking to e-cigarettes. There's also the argument e-cigarettes can't be considered safe. Well, we've looked at the whole safety debate already, and I've 
hopefully shown to you that no, they can't be considered absolutely safe, but we also said, well, what can be? Um, but the relevant comparison here is to tobacco smoking. And when we're comparing e-cigarette use to tobacco smoking, they're much, much less, less harmful. <coughs> Some more commonly expressed concerns. Um, some argue that people who might have otherwise quit using nicotine entirely might instead use the e-cigarette and continue a nicotine habit or develop a nicotine habit to e-cigarettes instead, where they, you know, whereas they might have otherwise quit completely. I think this raises a really interesting issue, the idea of, well, would it be bad to have a percentage of the population addicted to nicotine? Um, and I'm sure there are divided views on this. We know that the nicotine itself is relatively safe. It's the burning of tobacco, it's the carbon monoxide and tar that's associated with all the awful health risks of smoking. So people have different views about whether a, a kind of a safer addiction is okay or not. And in fact, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence have recently published new guidelines saying that they endorse using NRT for long periods of time, even lifetime, if people have to, if it stops them from smoking cigarettes. So um, I'm sure there's some strong views on that. There's also the argument we don't know what's in the liquid, we don't know what's in the vapour. Um, we are seeing more and more reports coming out about this and we do actually now know quite a lot about what's in the liquid and the vapour, much more than we know about tobacco smoke, which contains 10,000, 100,000 different chemicals, and we don't know a lot, about some, a lot about these. So we do know more about e-cigarettes and what's in the liquid in the vapour than we know about tobacco smoking. That's not to say that um, it's not completely risk-free. We've seen that there are some, some small risks, but again, the relevant comparison is, is to tobacco cigarettes. And um, another common concern is this potential for nicotine overdosing or nicotine poisoning. So some argue that vapors might accidentally take too much nicotine on board and an overdose on it. We've already looked at, I've already discussed that this is unlikely to be the case because people can alter the amount that they get depending on how they use and they have quite good control over how much nicotine is, is taken in. The issue in relation to the e-cigarette liquid, I think, possibly is more of, of a cause for concern that we need perhaps to address, perhaps limiting the size of bottles, ensuring that a regulation is sufficiently implied to um, protect children from drinking it. If it smells nice as well, it might be particularly attractive. So ensuring that we do have um, proper labeling, um, proper childproof tops and so on across, across the board. And that brings me to the final issue of labelling. Some have argued that, uh, you know, that what, it's not what it says on the tin. So this bit might be labelled 18 milligrams per milliliter and when it's actually been tested, it doesn't contain that. Um, this is a quite a tricky issue really because we've also seen that people can take different amounts from it depending on, on how they use it. So although it's important to say how much is in it, I think perhaps some other information on there as well for the, for the new user in particular to say that yes, but it depends on kind of how you use it. And we're not sure yet at this stage um, how exactly, whether it's how long you puff or the intervals between puff and what's the kind of the maximal way of um, using it. Okay, so to summarize, um, E-cigarettes then, nicotine delivery devices that um, deliver nicotine via a vapour that's inhaled. And I hope you got this message that they are much less dangerous than cigarettes. There's increasing evidence that smokers are using them fairly successfully to help them to stop smoking and that large numbers of smokers are moving over to e-cigarettes. And if this is the case, it has huge potential for reducing harm at the public health level by helping to reduce the death and disease associated with um, tobacco smoking. Just some concern that any regulation that's overly cautious might end up um, not being in the best of interest of public health 
if it makes e-cigarettes much harder to get than uh, regular tobacco cigarettes. So we want to try and make them as, as readily available as we can to increase the competition with, with tobacco cigarettes. And I just want to say thank you to uh, my research group. That's um, Amanda Roberts, John Turner and Kirsty Saw, who have been involved with me throughout this um, e-cigarette work that I've conducted. And to my colleagues at UEL as well from corporate marketing and from advertising who have helped with the preparation. To my assistants tonight as well. To Totally Wicked for sponsoring the event. And um, the lecture is being recorded and um, it's going to be made available at that website where you registered your interest. So if you do want to get hold of the slides and you really want to hear me say all that again, <laughs> then uh, you can get hold of it there. And uh, finally, we'll just have questions. <laughs>